Hello and welcome back everyone. This is the fifth episode in the webinar series, What is Experiential Retail? Today, we're going to focus on the educational experience. Now, the magic of technology uh, lets me see that we have some repeat viewers. That's great. Thanks for coming back. And we also have some, some newcomers as well. So if it's your first time joining us, just let's take a moment and let us introduce ourselves and the webinar series in general. Um, so I'm Ian Johnson, founder of retail experience consultancy, Quinnin, and we work with leading product and service brands all over the world, and we help them transform their existing formats or we help them create new ones. And I'm Alex Whitlow, a senior design director here at Quinnin. Now, the retail climate is in flux. Many people are looking towards experiential retail as the answer, but the problem that we're encountering is that many people don't actually know what that is. They find it really difficult to discuss, define, and quantify what they mean by experiential retail. Yeah, and from what we see, there's no common framework that can bring together different teams or different departments to understand what this means. So we created this framework so that we could get some agreement on a common language. And so this webinar series, it focuses on this retail experience framework that we use. This is a tool that we have created to help discuss and define retail experiences. Okay, so in the series so far, we've set out the framework. We've also discussed the importance of getting the place and the customer journey correct. And now we're discussing the different experience realms. And all of the past webinars are available online. And this today's webinar will be available on our website after broadcast. Now the series uh, is made up of seven episodes. And as we said, this is the fifth. Um, each of the episodes is around 30 minutes long. We really try to keep it tight today. Uh, and that's broken up into about 20 minutes of discussion. And hopefully we'll have enough time at the end of that for about five or 10 minutes of Q and A. And if you have any questions, don't wait until the end to ask them. Please type them into, into the questions box as we go along. So uh, it's worth quickly just recapping our framework. Um, so at the core of our framework is this trinity of time, place, and people. And we look at people in two ways. These are essentially the same, but from different viewpoints. So firstly, from the customer point of view, these are the customer missions. These are the reasons why I go into store. And, the, and secondly, we look at it from the retailer's point of view. These are the experience realms that retailers create in store. And it's important to remind ourselves that the best experiences, the experiences that give the most meaning for customers, are those when retailers combine the different experience realms, when the retailer delivers retail environments that facilitate multiple customer missions. Yeah, the more realms the retailer includes, the more customer missions that are facilitated, and therefore the better chance the retailer has of creating an engaging and meaningful experience. So today, let's focus on the educational experience. Now, as you would expect, educational missions are about learning, but, but in our definition, the variety of educational missions that exist can be quite broad. Educational missions go beyond learning. They're about self-improvement, improving myself both mentally and physically. Yeah, Alex, these are about transformation. It's about the need to reach our full potential. And now in Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, this is about the need for self-actualization. And as society becomes even more connected, our reference points are changing. Today, we're being exposed to more and more of these idealistic examples of how we should be living our lives and how we can become the best version of ourselves. Yeah, and the, the, the boom in wellness is just an example of this coming to life. And to help us understand this idea of education and self-improvement, we use one of our spectrums. At one end, we have the mental improvement. Yeah, this is about educating myself in the traditional sense. This is about the intake of information and knowledge. And at the other end of the spectrum is physical improvement. Yeah, this doesn't have to be just bodybuilding. It could simply be the attempt to maintain mobility at an old age or learn some new basketball skills. Yeah, you could learn how to pass. Yeah, well, bounce pass. Um, uh, that's another webinar, perhaps. But uh, this is about becoming my best physical self, whatever that means for me. So why is this notion of education or self-improvement so important? Well, the truth is, we are curious beings. Humans, by our very, very nature, ask questions, we explore, we discover. 
we need to understand things and it is this that has enabled our progress as a species yeah without learning how did we learn how to feed ourselves how do we fish so at a fundamental level educating ourselves is about survival but our desire for self-improvement also comes from within it is about internal fulfillment the act of learning something new or improving can bring a great deal of happiness and personal satisfaction and this improvement is linked to status the acknowledgement that I get from others for my skills has a huge impact. It proves my worth to society and defines me as an individual. So let's talk about an educational mindset. What are the considerations that I take into account when I'm trying to understand my educational needs? What is it I need to improve at? Is it mental or is it physical? So if it's a mental improvement that I'm looking for, does this involve higher education? You know, for these traditional disciplines like law, medicine, finance, even engineering, perhaps I would consider going to a university or a college. But it could also be skills that I'm looking for. This could be high level apprenticeships like those available at Bentley. Or equally, Al, oh, this could just be a, the skills I need to bake a cake. So if it's physical improvement that I'm after, this could be for my body or my soul. So once I've considered what I need to improve at, then I next might consider time. When do I need to improve by? How long does this improvement take? Okay, and so after when, I probably would consider how I can best improve. And how is quite an interesting consideration. How I learn, how I improve is different for everybody. It's personal. Yeah, what method of learning suits me best? Firstly, I need to understand if this improvement is best done in a social or in a solitary context. Then I need to understand if what I want to learn, how I want to learn, is it through visual, is it through auditory, reading or writing, or in kinesthetic ways? Or is it a combination of all of these? Yeah, and uh, this is becoming increasingly more possible in today's multi-sensory, over-connected world. Another consideration is who can help me improve? Is there a particular individual, a particular department or body, or even a particular brand that I feel can help me improve best? Yeah, and as always, Al, uh, there's cost. And this is a consideration we can just we just can't ignore this. Is this learning free or are there tuition, membership or even entry fees attached? And perhaps the final consideration is where can I improve? Traditionally, this has been about locations and our institutions, both mental or physical. Today, the educational experience is expanding way beyond learning within institutions or at home. Now, with our connected world, having information at hand with immediate feedback and results makes an advanced level of self-improvement possible almost anywhere. Yeah, and if we take our, our runner who's... They're out in the volcanic landscape. It was only about 10 years ago when this guy was delighted if he could know how far he had run. But not today. Not only does he demand to have his heartbeat, his pace, split times fed to him in real time, he needs that information posted to social media so that his friends know how much he is actually improving. So the mindset involved in an educational experience is, is a bit more complex and fluid than the mindset of other experience missions. The order of these considerations is often very personal and specific to the individual's circumstances and their needs. Okay, so why, why is this important for brands? Why are we talking about an educational experience in retail? Well, with our innate desire to improve, coupled with an increasing level of information and ways to access that information, our appetite to learn and better ourselves is growing. Yeah, and that need, that desire has given birth to new challenges in a world that is oversaturated with information. To actually understand what information I need is becoming more and more difficult. Yeah, information overload at every corner. Now, the choices available to me are greater than ever before. The products and services are getting more and more complex. All of this information, this oversaturation, is exposing knowledge and still skill gaps that I want to fill. And the traditional methods of self-improvement are not supporting this need enough. The traditional institutions that I turned to in the past have not been able to keep pace. 
yeah, for example, the libraries here in the UK are suffering. Whether it's a lack of funding, a lack of vision, they're all struggling to understand where they actually fit into today's society. Whereas, on the other hand, we have brands who are not afraid to fill this gap. Is the new educational institution the retail flagship store? Perhaps not for everything, but certainly for some things. Okay, so what does this mean when thinking about educational experiences within the retail store? If we relate back to the four different mission approaches we identified and discussed in webinar four. Yeah, is the approach to an educational experience combined, singular, varied or dynamic? Now, we feel that that educational mission will always be a combined mission. A customer's reason to educate them in store will never be singular, solely focused on just the educational experience. That educational mission will always have an element of social. And when that's done well, it will also be entertaining. And of course, the educational mission involves a varied approach. If we use a cooking class in a retail store as the context here, we can see that one person's educational mission is another person's social mission and another person's entertainment mission. Yeah, meaning that attending a class in store can be an educational, social, or entertainment experience. It's all depending on the nature of the individual. And yes, the retailer will need to accommodate all of these when planning and curating any type of educational experience in store. Now, it's important to acknowledge that the educational mission, more often than not, starts outside the in-store mission. But there are situations where the educational mission is actually activated in store. And this is where the approach is dynamic. It's a dynamic mission. Yeah, a dynamic mission is when the consumer's original mission in store has changed or is superseded by an in store prompt. So imagine going into store on a functional mission to purchase a kettle. And off in the distance, you are disrupted by an event taking place. You wander over to see what all that commotion is about, and soon you are taking part in a cooking class. But let's talk now about how retailers can actually deliver the educational experience in a retail store. Now, to understand how this educational mission can be delivered, we use another one of our spectrums. We introduced this in our last webinar, but it positions incidental interventions at one end of the spectrum and immersive interventions at the other. And we use these words, incidental and immersive, to refer to the level of intervention. Both of these types are needed to accommodate the range of educational missions that consumers undertake. Okay, so the incidental intervention. This includes basic product information and knowledge. In fact, this idea is actually in competition with the digital and online experience. Yeah, digital is really good at organizing and displaying a lot of information. It enables comparison and searching through a large and complex range of products. So while digital can actually involve three of the four methods of learning, it takes into account visual auditory and reading, its shortfall is the fact that it can never actually involve the kinesthetic method of learning. It can differentiate itself from online by physicalizing the information in clear and tangible ways. Another incidental intervention is simply to have the actual product there to try and touch. To actually feel the real product can add a level of understanding that is difficult to replicate. Yeah, and this is common sense. I mean, from food to fashion retailers, they've been doing this. But in other retail, especially technology, many are missing the opportunity that physical retail has to differentiate itself from online. Yeah, I'm not sure how this happens. Perhaps they just let the loss prevention team define the journey a little bit too much. Yeah, having dummy products, products out of reach from customers or clamped down with security devices is unacceptable for today's demanding consumer. But perhaps the most impactful type of incidental intervention includes the personalized information that can be delivered through staff expertise. The knowledge and information that can be personalized through a great staff interaction coupled with real products or other physical props is a powerful way to differentiate the in-store from the online experience. Okay, now at the immersive end of the spectrum, 
we see educational interventions that leverage the physical space to differentiate themselves from online educational experiences. Yeah, and these are generally scheduled and probably require sign up to attend. These interventions, they start to fill the gap left by the closure of some of those traditional places we have learned in. Yeah, these are reasons to go into store. They can actually revitalize the brand and people's perceptions of it. And these can come in a variety of shapes and sizes. They could simply be lessons where knowledge and expertise is shared, or one-to-one tutorials to learn new skills. Or, or uh, perhaps creative workshops that, that open up new possibilities, or even physical training sessions where I can actually improve my body or soul. And what happens between the scheduled event, the immersive, and the product information card, the incidental? Here, here we find demonstrations. Now, these are not scheduled events that you can sign up to, but more the ongoing product performances in store. Yeah, and my favorite is is at Hamley's. And here they they dress up as the cast from Harry Potter and actually play with the merchandise. Yeah. Also, at Dyson's flagship store, they use the physical environment along with products and props to engage and show customers real products in curated situations. So... That helps us understand what the incidental and immersive interventions are. But understanding how the level of these interventions impact the customer experience and the purpose of each of these interventions is also really important. The incidental is a crucial part of the in-store experience. It provides the foundation of an educational experience. But this is about informing and creating awareness. Yeah, while the immersive, these interventions should involve the customer into the experiences so much that they actually become transformative experiences. Yeah, here, um, let's make reference to a Chinese proverb. This reminds us of the power and the opportunity that physical retail has when they create more immersive types of educational experiences. Tell me and I'll forget. Show me and I'll remember. Involve me and I'll understand. Now you can see this actually ladders up almost perfectly to the spectrum of educational interventions. The product information card is telling me, that's the incidental. The demonstrations are showing me, and the classes and workshops are involving me. Those are the immersive. And as Ian just mentioned, this emphasizes the power of physical retail. How physical retail can implement all four of the methods that we use to learn. In fact, this is what sets physical retail apart from all other channels, specifically the digital channels. It's only the physical retail that can use the kinesthetic method of self-improvement to involve customers in an immersive way that can have a real transformative impact. But on top of all of this, you must make sure that your immersive educational experiences are right for your brand. We, We question, is it correct to have yoga classes in a bank or in a supermarket cafeteria. But if you get this immersive intervention right, the transformative experience you deliver will create a level of loyalty and trust that is extraordinary. Yeah, it's the educational experiences that develop a connection to the brand that goes beyond almost anything you can create in any other channel. So let's quickly come back and talk about our retail experience framework. Uh, perhaps we can walk through some examples. Sure. In our previous webinars, we used the framework to demonstrate that the functional and social missions can happen at almost any touch point along the customer journey. The educational mission is a little more prescriptive. It does happen throughout the journey, but does not appear in the select and transact stages. Yeah, the select and transact stages on the customer journey are what we call conclusive stages. They're actually actions that result from the previous stage along the journey. You select after you discover or learn about your products, and you purchase or transact after you have consulted with a staff member about the relevance of the products and the services. So if we leave these stages out, the select and transact for the time being, let's review the educational stages of the customer journey. And we start with attract. More and more we see brands using their facades and specifically their windows to inform and bring awareness to ideas beyond the product's information and the offers. 
These are on the incidental side of the spectrum and are not necessarily about self-improvement. Okay, so here, Nike, Nike Town in London, they've activated their window with an interactive display. Now, for some, this is just pure entertainment. It's fun. But it does also educate it. It actually informs and brings awareness to a shoe technology in a fun and entertaining way. Now, Patagonia and Kenzo use their windows to raise awareness and inform their customers. But these go beyond products and offers. Yeah, they inform customers about campaigns and brand initiatives that do educate. They have elements of self-improvement. You know, what can I do to improve water quality around the world? And yes, these are still incidental, but they align to the brand values and offer up a, a different way to learn about what matters to their brands. Okay, now let's look at welcome. The welcome stage is part of the educational mission. This is still an introduction to the store environment, but it can be taken beyond the initial, hello, you can find what you need in aisle nine. This clearly sits on the incidental side of the spectrum, but the human interaction informs and brings awareness of further educational opportunities that are personalized to each consumer. By creating a physical touch point in store, John Lewis captures this learning mentality, bringing awareness and informing all of its visitors that education matters. Okay, now let's talk about the discovery part of the customer journey. This is where educational missions come to life. Yeah, this is where you would expect them to be. It can cover both the incidental and immersive parts of the spectrum, although these are generally not scheduled. Let's, let's run through some examples. Um, let's start with Allbirds. Now, Allbirds allows customers to understand their shoes better, educating their customers by using science museum type displays. They have clear graphics, real, raw, tangible materials. And Dyson, as you would expect, uses a bit more high-tech engineering displays to inform customers on innovative product features. Yeah, and the Discovery Store from Telstra in Sydney. They're placing learning and play at the heart of the store. They're using physical devices layered with digital screens to create interactive and engaging learning experiences. Now, these live products, complemented by interactive screens, tell you about the product information and life benefits. And all of these tell-me types of discovery are more incidental than immersive, but they leverage the physical environments and the kinesthetic method of learning that only physical retail can. Okay, now this is Lush. Now, in addition to the beautifully handwritten product information that tell me about the products, the staff at Lush can easily pivot to simple demonstrations to show customers the difference between the products. And Mamas and Papas here in the UK, they have a real car in store that enables staff to demonstrate to customers how to attach baby seats in the car, or show them how well the buggies fit into the boot. Now, as Al mentioned, you know, education comes to life in the discovery stage. There are many examples. One of my favorite is Vagabond Wines. Here, they actually encourage customers to taste their wines using product dispensaries that combine bottles and fridges and detailed product information. They're inviting their customers to compare and contrast different wines. All of this just to make sure they get the wine they like. Yeah, and in our local cheese shop, not only do they tell you interesting facts about the cheese in a clear and understandable way, where it's made, how it's different, they also encourage you to taste taste the cheese. Now, Al, I know you're not a big cheese fan, but when we went, it was amazing. They actually started to show us how aging of the cheese, how they wrap it with leaves or covering it with ash. They related this back and educated us about how that wrapping related to the taste. Yeah, like you say, me and cheese do not get on, but actually, I walked out of that store feeling like I knew more about cheese than, than anybody else, certainly more than I ever thought possible. Okay, finally, our last example. Now, this is a different type of DIY store, Perch. Now, here they push this try and learn concept further by actually involving their customer. Amongst other types of learning experiences you can find in store, they actually make a, take a booking to take a shower in the store. So learning firsthand about the shower before you purchase. Now, we haven't done this ourselves, but we heard that several people a week arrive in store with their bathing suits to learn more about that shower that they want to purchase. And this is done in a completely immersive way. 
Now, we could go on sharing many more examples, but we won't. But for you to take away, it's key to know that discovery, which brings delight and surprise to customer experience, is intrinsically tied to the educational mission. So let's look at consult. Consult is about confirming your selection, understanding if the product you have chosen is right for you. So this is about learning if the product is right for your needs. Yeah, it's a deeper type of learning that is typically tied to interacting with expert, knowledgeable staff. So at Glossier, an online cosmetics brand who has opened a built store, they have put their expert staff at the center of the product display to consult customers on the products that suit them best. Yeah, this same type of expertise is becoming more and more common throughout traditional retail, you know, such as nutritionists in supermarkets. Yeah, and we love the experts on hand in IKEA who help you choose and format your, your new kitchen or bathroom. Yeah, and Lowe's have taken this consultation to the next level using AR and VR during consultative process. And finally, SK2, the Japanese cosmetic brand, has leveraged new technologies and facial recognition to, its, to assist that traditionally staff-led consultative process. So with skin condition analysis, followed by automated product recommendations. This is actually amazing and innovative. SK2 are taking the education of your own skin beyond anything you have ever experienced before. The after sales part of the customer journey involves learning about how to get the most out of the products and services that you have already purchased. So this includes repairs and account types of services, but this is another moment of the customer journey where the educational mission thrives. Yeah. Now, it's been mentioned perhaps in most retail insight blogs around the world that experiences now matter more than the products and services themselves, that the products, they can no longer differentiate your brand enough. And here is where brands can really differentiate themselves and stand out. It is after sales where brand loyalty and trust is best developed and nurtured. Okay, so... Let's run through some examples here. Now, Google, the, the innovative driver that it is, has created a physical store experience where they invite customers to develop new skills for the digital world. Now, there's no products in sight, and you can just book a course or a coaching session or even just drop in. It's here you can take a course on keeping your family safe online or perhaps a coaching session on how to write for social media. And if you cannot make it to one of these after-sales centers, Google's digital garage will come to you. Not confined by any geography, the Google bus parks up in town centres up and down the UK. Now, all of these types of pure educational experiences, now they're feeding this emerging consumer appetite to better themselves. The Rafa Mobile Clubhouse fills this same need. Cyclists in this largely social community are supported in their individual efforts to improve their riding with personal training plans, or improve their repair and maintenance skills and general cycling knowledge. Okay, now Nike. Now they're turning their attention to teaching customers how to create unique clothing through in-store workshops that enable customers to personalize different sports attire. And at Sephora, there is a specifically dedicated space to facilitate beauty classes. Yeah, and Patagonia, one of my favorite brands. Now, they regularly turn their stores into educational hubs where they host lectures and speakers after hours. And, of course, we have Apple. Apple have turned their entire retail store experience into a high street educational institution. A clear evolution of their successful genius bar, all their stores worldwide will now focus on teaching advanced skills and techniques beyond the basic use of Apple hardware and software. Yeah, these educational programs are designed to drive footfall to the store environment. But now, not only are Apple hosting various sessions in the store, they're actually extending this educational mindset to include activities like photography and sketching walks that happen outside the store. And all of this, including the Kids Hour that brings kids and parents close together, is appropriate to their brand. It provides meaningful experiences and helps build long-lasting relationships. Okay, the goodbye part of the journey. Now, we originally wondered if this goodbye was actually part of the educational mission. We thought it might be beyond, but when we actually started to discuss and look a bit further, we found that not to be the case. 
the shopping bag itself, once a coveted artifact of the luxury shopping experience, is now being used by many retailers to inform and bring awareness. Now, there's a supermarket in the Midwest of America that's leveraging their shopping bag in an incidental way to educate their customers on where they can recycle. Now, it's not transformative, but it just reminds us that there are opportunities to deliver educational missions everywhere if you are willing to explore your customer journey. Okay, so no matter which brand it is, no matter if the intervention is incidental or immersive, there is a commercial reward for all of these types of educational activities. But above this, they are driven by the needs and requirements of customers, all wanting to improve themselves. Now, we've, we've covered a lot here, so let's summarize this into the three key insights that we believe you need to take away with you. Okay, so firstly, retail stores are the new form of educational institution. They are actually perfectly placed to accommodate all four ways of learning. The visual, the auditory, reading and writing, and of course, the kinesthetic. Secondly, simply informing the customer and raising awareness is no longer enough. The customer's expectation is that you will help them improve themselves. And finally, providing meaningful and appropriate self-improvement opportunities to customers will deepen their loyalty and trust with your brand. So that's the, the main part of the webinar uh, completed. Uh, I guess we wanted to get to a few Q&A. Um, we're a little short on time here, but uh, we, we probably have time for at least two more questions. So, so um, why don't uh, I ask you one, you ask me one, and we'll see where we are. Perfect. Sounds good. Shall I start? Shall I ask you one? Yeah, go on. Okay. This one's been here a, a little while. So, um, interesting. How will VR and AR affect education in retail? And um, just thinking out aloud here, I think you could probably break that out into into two answers, I suppose. At one On one level, you could ask what, how does VR and AR um affect the store experience if used in store but probably more interestingly to me is how vr and ar can affect the store when it's used away from the store experience from an educational standpoint okay um i'll try to be concise here but that that's a big question and and um uh, maybe even would uh, demand its own webinar but I guess ultimately, you know, both of these technologies, AR and VR, will, will have a big effect, a big effect on the whole retail uh, landscape. Um, specifically, when I when I think about learning, um, you know, they're not quite there yet. The sort of um, they're not quite there in terms of of um, they're not ubiquitous um, within the within our social landscape. Not everyone uses them, and certainly some of the technology uh, needs to improve. Certainly, the haptic sort of technology uh, needs to improve if it wants to uh, uh, take over from some of the sort of physical and kinesthetic types of learning that are so uh, easily done in physical retail. Um, I think there's another interesting point there, just about online learning and and. Um, I think this this is actually having a much more immediate impact. Um, I mean, Al, I, I actually, I don't know if I told you this, but I actually learned how to, to uh, complete the Rubik's Cube um, watching a YouTube video. So, they're, you know, they are powerful. I mean, if I can learn that, um, I think anyone can learn something. Um, and so, you know, all of these technologies, online learning, VR, AR, they, they all kind of um, deal with the challenges of, of location, right? They certainly allow you to read a far wider audience which is great they're feeding that sort of customer need for for uh, improvement um, but until they um, they they actually um, address the the kinesthetic method um, you know they're never going to really replace the in-store learning um, but I guess before we get there before these technologies can have their impact and and, and you know retailers and, and brands um, they need to lean into learning and the educational mission they need to build these immersive types of, of learning experiences into their path to purchase they need to build them into their customer journey so that 
um, you know, learning is, is 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 introduced and is you know a consistent part of each brand's DNA. And so that's the first step, and we're not there yet. And so that needs to happen, and then ultimately VR will become another tool um, in the the number of tools that we use to to teach people or people learn with. Um, and I, I guess that's the same in store, you know, um, right now VR, AR is being used in store, but it's a little social, you know, it's a bit awkward, you know, putting on, on a headset and stuff. So they will have an impact. They do need to improve. But right now I see them as just another tool to help us learn, um, just like a Blackboard or, or a PowerPoint presentation. Great. I hope that's enough um, to answer the question. Uh, running short on time here, Al, because I, I, I went on a bit. So um, if I ask you, uh, here's a good one. Um, this is really close to our heart. So how uh, does this new learning environment impact the role of the staff? Okay. Um, so the new learning environment, I think when you... Just to try and understand what that means, I think we're referring to probably the online learning tools where everybody is learning everything everywhere. So if we, you mentioned the online learning tools and that you've learned how to use a Rubik's Cube or complete a Rubik's Cube uh, online, that's done through video. There's obviously loads of other channels, whether that be through through chats, chatbots or communication apps where there is just this uh surge of information coming at customers um so what is the role of staff in store well as we i think we mentioned in some of our slides the role of staff they can really start to curate and personalize that information for the consumer so if i'm just feeling like i've got information overload i can go into store and know that that staff member can actually tell me what i need to know not what everybody needs to know um but on top of that um i think when a customer comes into store they are more informed they are more aware they're more educated than ever before so it's absolutely essential that the staff know more than them still i mean how underwhelming it would be if i as a customer go into store and the staff know less than i do about their products and services and their brands. I think so we've all been there before. Yeah, yeah, but moving forward, that is unacceptable. Um, moving forward, the staff must again; they need to be the experts in their field. Um, they need to know exactly what they're talking about. It's no, they're, they're no longer just cashiers. Uh, absolutely, and I guess I guess the the skill set that we'll be looking for will will change as well. You know, um, they can't just be great sales. Uh, people they'll need to have um, great communication skills great uh, knowledge skills I mean these, these are new types of, of skills um, so um, I don't know there's a few other questions here that I, that I don't think we have time to get to today um, but we'll as usual we'll get back to them in the next week or so yeah so as always we'll um, we'll come back to you all with uh answers to the questions we haven't answered we'll we'll email those back to you we'll also uh be uploading um this episode this broadcast for you to download if you want um but also within the next week we'll be releasing details of webinar six our next webinar which will be surrounding the entertain retail experiences where we'll take a deeper dive into those Sounds good. So I think that's all we have time for today. Uh, really appreciate uh, you all joining us. Um, that's all from us today. Yep. Thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you next time.